All right, so I figured I'd go ahead and introduce you guys right at the start. I'd like to introduce you guys to John and Pierre, the team leads of Atlas, the creators of the Next web browser, and hopefully other software that we'll find out about as we go. That was kind of the only thing you guys have on list on your website. So if there's any other achievements you guys want to point out, now's a good time. <laughs> I can eat a large pizza. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how notable that is, but, uh, you know. It's a pretty good stepping stone for any company. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to just start off by having you guys like talk a bit about yourselves and introduce yourselves as well as Atlas. Um, I'm not really, your company didn't say too much about like what position you guys consider yourselves in within the company. So I figured I'd let you guys answer for yourselves. So, um, to, to give a little background on the company, basically about four years ago or three years ago, uh, I was working just on Nix kind of as a hobby, uh, by myself. And uh, Pierre sent me an email saying, hey, basically, I want to work on this project. And at that point, I was like, well, okay, now we have to make a company. So we formed a company and we struggled a lot in the beginning with, uh, you know, how to pay ourselves and how to actually make any money. And uh, we, you know, went through a lot of phases. Actually, in the beginning, the key the key way for us to make any money was contracting. So I would find some contracting leads and then, you know, Pierre and I would work on them and we'd, we'd make some money. Uh, along the way, we grew a little bit and we had a uh, another co-founder at the time. His name was Vincent. Uh, unfortunately, things didn't work out, but uh, he was also part of that kind of early contracting development phase. And that brings us to kind of today and what Atlas does today. And that's that we've won some uh, some research grants from the European Union, and we develop uh, basically implementations of uh, cutting edge, or I don't know, cutting edge, but you know, novel, rather novel uh, interfaces to the internet. So that's what we do. At, as per titles and and who does what, we don't really have any uh, formalized title, but. Um, if I was to break it apart into a traditional structure, I would say that Pierre is the CTO and I am the CEO, if I had to, to do that. Cool, cool. All right, well, that's pretty that's pretty interesting. I've A big question I had when I looked into Next was kind of how you guys got started, so that makes a lot more sense now, kind of how um, it started from a hobby, which I feel like a lot of startups and everything kind of go from, so that's a pretty interesting, uh, interesting phase that you guys went through doing contracting work. Did you guys, so one of the things that you guys list a lot there at your website, and I think a lot of the things that people know of Atlas for is using a common lisp. Did you guys apply common lisp in your contracting work as well? Or was that mostly just working with uh, whatever, maybe like the company that was hiring you had you work with? No, we were using common lisp, which is what made contracting infinitely harder. Um, <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to convince the client that Common Lisp is right for their application, and you and it also has to be right for their application. Uh, if if we were doing some generic contracting, we could have found deals left and right, you know. But one thing about developers, especially Lisp developers, is it's very difficult to motivate them to work on something that isn't Lisp. <laughs> I can, I can, not that I would call myself a list developer, but I try to force it into some of my work if I can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you can understand that it's that much more fulfilling and that much more interesting to work uh, on a, on a list project. So, uh, I, I couldn't exactly pitch a team project, be like, Hey guys, we're going to be working on a, a JavaScript project that no one would raise their hand. They wouldn't want to work on it. So. <laughs> Uh, one thing that I was also interested in is uh, since you guys are focused on a fairly niche language for the most part, um, I was wondering what sort of a team size would you guys say you have now? Like obviously there's uh, John, yourself, Pierre. Um, and I know that there is like, I th think there's more to your team than just that. Um, I know there's uh, Pablo. Is that correct? What his name was? Sorry, I hadn't read, read over the emails in a bit. It's Pedro, but that's okay. Pedro, Pedro Pablo. <laughs> Whatever, PP, you know. 
Um, in order to avoid uh, me just talking on and on, Pierre, would you like to alternate uh, talking? <laughs> yeah, sure. We can do that. So uh, currently we have uh, two other uh, co-workers. Uh, one, as you mentioned, is Pedro. Uh, so he's, he's joined us a couple of months ago. And um, so currently he is, uh, he's more into the community-oriented side of things. Uh, and that's where actually he, that's how we got, a, we got in touch with you again. And so uh, that was uh, pretty helpful, I guess. So thank you, Pedro. And uh, the other guy who is working with us is uh, Artyom. And Artyom has joined us, I think, uh, two, about two years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, John. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, Pedro is, uh, sorry, uh, Artyom is mostly on the tech technical side of things. Uh, He's actually extremely uh, active these days, or he's been really uh, contributing a lot of really good stuff you now over the last two years. So he's still a student, so he's been uh, he's been contributing to Next as uh, in form of uh, internships and contracting work. Um, and uh, yeah, so we will see what happens in the future with uh, when he's done with his studies. Nice, that's pretty good. So that's uh, that's your guys' whole team. So you're about a size of like four, four of yourselves. Indeed, we're four, we're four people. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. At this point, do you guys, I assume you guys still are both uh, developing on Nixt as well um, at this point. Yeah, so um, it's not possible that any of us is not a developer. So yeah, that's what that's, what, that's kind of what I figured. Okay. Yeah. Another question I was wondering was that on your website, you mentioned that you work with uh, other languages other than Common Lisp is that mostly related to the contracting stuff, or is that related to other products that you guys plan on working on as well? Uh, you guys list like Python and JavaScript. I assumed that was the contracting stuff. Yeah, that was some uh, contracting stuff uh, it, that that's in the early days that uh, I had done. I had been working actually as a Python contractor, and I put it under the same umbrella. I guess Pierre wants to say something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, not really available. Just it was just John and not me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it it was basically to avoid closing the door on any potential contracts. But again, like like I said earlier, it was incredibly difficult to actually motivate anyone to work on anything that wasn't Lisp. <laughs> One question that I kind of had was where you guys see Nixt as well as Atlas going in the future. Do you guys see it branching off? Um, to a broader sense outside of Atlas, um, sorry, outside of Nixt, or do you see Atlas being very much tied towards Nixt for the most part in the future? Um, may I answer this, John? Yeah, sure. I'm curious what your answer is, actually. <laughs> yeah, feel free to both answer that because obviously you guys aren't going to have the exact same idea in the, for what's yeah, going on. Yeah, in the exactly. So, uh, well, then my point of view here is that uh, so Nixt is the, the funding stone of everything we're building upon. So we are obviously focusing on it and we probably keep it as our main focus for uh, a long time at least. Uh, but currently we are uh, trying to develop an ecosystem on top of it. So there will be more to come, applications and well, maybe different forms of programs built, all built around Next. So that's the idea, I think. John? Yeah, it's a, it's a, we have the same vision. So I see Next as the first step towards actually kind of a Lisp OS. I want to recreate a lot of the uh, paradigms that, that were lost when uh, Lisp systems came out of favor. And uh, this is a bit ambitious, but ultimately I would like to have uh, a complete system. I can imagine producing our own laptops with our own operating system, and it's Lisp all the way down to the, uh, to the silicon. So, very that ambitious. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I just think it would be really great, and uh, it would be impressive what you could do. The stability of such a system, how it would be a way to. I mean, you'd have the ability to evolve your live system, unlike in the world of uh, Unix today, uh, mm -hmm. where you kind of restart and restart and restart and kill and restart. But anyways. No, I think that's something that uh, there's definitely like, I don't know, of the small community of people that are very interested in Lisp, I feel like that's uh, definitely the sort of thing that people would go crazy for. 
Yeah, and I, I would also like to to take it from being a very niche product to I don't want to become the next Windows, but <laughs> you know I would love for it to be accessible for a, a regular user. You know I would like people to be able to benefit from the advances in computing um, that they don't currently get to. Uh, if you're using a uh, Windows system today, I think there's a lot of room for um, improvement and that that would translate to a huge productivity increase for those who decide to use uh, you know this theoretical system that we would build. And, and actually that same uh, concept translates to Next. Uh, if you think about it, it, it did start as a frustration with not having Emacs as a browser, but if you abstract that, it actually means I'm frustrated that my browser isn't as powerful as I want it to be. It's not moldable like Emacs is. I can't, I, I can't effectively get information out of the internet. And by addressing that need, oh, hopefully we're a little bit better. You can liken it to this, right? If all of the programmers in the world were forced to use uh, Notepad, you know, the Notepad that comes <laughs> with Windows, right? You can imagine there would be a significant uh, decrease in the effectiveness and, and the productivity of those people. And that's exactly what we have happening today with the world of web browsers. We're all using the equivalent of Notepad for the web. Totally. No, I think that's a really good point, especially when you think of it from the concept uh, or context of like when you work with uh, a development team and you're working with, for example, like for my day job, I work with Java. Um, you can tell like the people that don't, that would rather be working with another language and are stuck with it are like much less productive, much less inclined to go that extra mile on the work that they're doing versus like uh, if they're working with like a tool that they enjoy, obviously they're more than happy to put in that bit of extra time or a bit of extra effort to make the product just that much better. I feel like you definitely see that with a uh, environment like you've described, one that you can interactively work with. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I had as a question while we're on the topic of Nixt is the, um, or I guess this that's a bit farther beyond than just Nixt, obviously. I obviously wouldn't build a web browser into a, a whole system. I feel like that'd be pretty wild. That'd be like living on Chrome OS, but as a, but a Lisp version of it, I guess. Um, one thing that uh, I was interested in is your guys' uh, thoughts on using um, WebKit to GTK uh, as the back end for Nixt. I know um i as well as like other people have been like uh interested in the idea of working with uh webkit or sorry uh qt web engine which is a blink based web engine and i know you guys have built like a working example of it but i know that there hasn't been too much work on it just would like to know what you guys think of like the potential of working with that in the future uh yeah maybe i can answer this question so uh quite a bit to say about it uh First of all, I mean, uh, if we had all the time and all the workforce in the world, we would obviously support it uh, well, as much as we can. That would be great. I mean, so the, um, that's also how Nix got built in the first place with uh, render agnosticity in mind. That means that uh, not much of the parts that we've got in Nix uh, depend on the, on the web render, like WebKit or, or Web Engine. Uh, they are quite independent, and the, the only parts that do, they are made in a way that are that they are easily interfaceable to any renderer. So that makes it quite easy to implement uh, uh, support for another renderer like Web Engine. We just need time, and um, well, uh, uh, that, that currently we haven't got much. So well, it very well may be that in the coming month, uh, if we find the time to work on it, we would we will be able to support it. Um, at much greater length. Currently, the the, um, uh, the experimental support that we've got enabled us to start it, run a prompt buffer and uh, some basic uh, web running commands. But then, uh, well, some much of the input was broken and so on. So, I uh, just needed some fine tuning that caused a couple of weeks of work. And well, if one of us finds the time to do it, well, it will be there at some point, I guess. So, fingers crossed. And one question I was wondering about, because I, I had heard like a similar thing before and some of the, on your guys' subreddit, as well as like a few other places, I had heard like a similar sentiment, so I figured I'd ask here. 
But uh, something that I was wondering about was what you guys thought about, like, have you guys considered the potential of doing like milestone related um, crowdfunding sort of systems where you'd just say like, if we can get this funding, we can dedicate a developer to this uh, thing or something like that, or maybe reaching out to the community and seeing if uh, a developer would be interested in it. It's definitely a, a really good idea. And um, it works for a lot of projects where there is a uh, established uh, common need and everyone agrees, hey, or at least there's a clear majority, hey, we want this feature and there's not the, the support. So it's like kind of like a bidding system, right? Okay, if you want us to build this feature, then, then you know, vote for it, you know, support us, and we'll do it. And we've implemented this approach twice in the past. So we did launch two um, Indiegogo campaigns where we outlined a set of objectives, and we said, hey, if we reach this this funding objective, then we would like to implement these features. We also have a um, a voter list where we actually have people vote on the next uh, set of features, we run a, th a, a survey, uh, you know, I don't know, every three months. It does It's not really consistent, but we run a survey every so often. Uh, and you could imagine that we could feasibly first run a survey and say, hey, uh, please tell us what your thoughts are. Where do you think we should focus our time? And then thereafter launch an Indiegogo campaign and say, okay, this is what we've learned from the community. Based on these wants, each of these things will cost this amount of time. Um, and we could run such a campaign. The reason we don't do it is mostly because of the effort involved in actually setting up the campaign, fulfilling the, the, uh, the perks. So you're typically expected to get something for your 5, 10, 20 euro or dollars. You know, So we'd have to make a bunch of shirts or make a bunch of mugs. And the last time we did that, it took like forever to find the right company to source it and to, and to ship things out. Um, yeah, that seems like a pretty big, that seems like a common tr struggle with uh, the Indiegogo sort of stuff. Um, I think also it is like, there are drawbacks to purely being a community organized thing too. So I think there are benefits to being able to make your own calls on some things too. Like otherwise you'd end up with just making a JavaScript browser if you just had whatever the majority of what everybody thought you wanted to do. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, in some ways we still have to do what the majority of the people want to do, obviously. And we want to, we want to make a product that works for the people and our approach that we think is a more sustainable approach. And, you know, we kind of, we outlined this in our, in our article about uh, sustainable open source is to build applications on top of our own framework and, and sell those applications. And hopefully people enjoy them and they say, you know what? I want this. I'll buy this. Yeah, I saw that you guys have a few of those. I thought that was a really interesting um, approach to things. I think it kind of like leads towards what you were talking about, a, uh, a Lisp system sort of thing, um, where everything can be built on top of uh, Dixt, kind of similar to how people use Emacs. That That's exactly what it is. And we actually have this clear distinction, right? So an application built on top of the next is kind of a standalone thing that shouldn't necessarily be uh, part of a browser core. So a good example would be, um, well, the, the application that I'm working on now, it's called Kharon and it's a task manager. Oh yeah. So it's something like, um, top or H top, but with, uh, Emacs like interface. So we have the prompt buffer, right? So you can do all sorts of narrowing on any column. There's like 124 attributes you can filter processes by, uh, and you can do all sorts of interesting things. And I guess um, that should not necessarily be in a browser. <laughs> yeah. uh, did we just lose Pierre? I can't tell if my. Oh, there we go. Never yeah, mind. it's fine. I'm sure his computer. <laughs> He's running Sorry, gigs. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, ah. <laughs> um, no, that's really that's really interesting. I didn't even think of something on the level of like top would work for it, but that's a pretty interesting project. I think there's a lot of uh, interest. I think the idea of monetizing that sort of stuff also makes a lot of sense on the topic of like, I feel like even from people that are fans of open source, it's hard to really see 
how to get income and like people want to support open source, but it's hard to really know how much to support by. But if somebody's giving you a product and you're paying for it, it's kind of easy to reason with yourself on where you're putting the money towards. Absolutely. And one other thing I would like to point out that's really key is uh, this is something Pierre and I had uh, talked about a lot. Uh, we wanted our software to still be um, accessible to those who don't necessarily have the means to afford it. So I can imagine that if you have less money, less uh, free money flowing around, maybe most of your expenses are going towards your housing and your food, and you don't have 20, 30 bucks, there's still, it still is nice to have the idea that you can benefit from the information that's on the internet and from the applications that we have. Um, maybe you could use a better top application so you can always fill out a application on a on an as needed basis basically saying what's your what what do you need this application for and some other uh, minor uh, housekeeping details and we'll send you a free copy <laughs> that's really cool i've uh that's a rare that i don't think i've actually heard of other companies really doing that so that's a pretty that's great to hear um one thing that i was interested in was uh was like on the topic of making these applications that run on top of Nixt. Do you guys have, I guess theoretically there is a documentation, but is there like a structure for the API that you guys expect people to use or do you expect it to kind of be like with Emacs where you kind of can just package things up and it just acts as a library and you just call it as a command? Um, I wasn't too sure if you guys have like an intended way for these applications to be integrated or if you, or if they're just basically libraries that you access. Um, I, I suppose that uh, we, so I, I'm not sure I got your, your question right, so I'll try to answer uh, yeah. as well as I can. Um, so, so basic, everything is common Lisp. So basically, if you want to create an extension, you can do, as long as it's common Lisp, I mean, we work and you can do pretty much whatever you want. Now, in, in common Lisp, there is, uh, like, like with many other languages, uh, there's a, such a thing called uh, internal symbols or internal functions, methods, and so on, and mm -hmm. external ones, or the exported ones. Mm -hmm. So you, the API that we are uh, exporting is, oops, sorry about this, is the, um, uh, it's basically all the export symbols. And uh, well, we expect the extensions to follow this, uh, which is already uh, quite a lot. I mean, they, it gives uh, the users a lot of flexibility. They can do pretty much everything that we're doing. But if there's something internal that we, they can they want to change, actually, what's great with Common Lisp is that they can still do it, in the sense that uh, you can access and modify internals in any Common Lisp program. So this is at the language level. Uh, so we cannot really forbid it, but uh, it will be. Uh, it can be. So it, the way Common Lisp writes it is that every internal access is uh, sy syntactically. Um, noticeable because you would write do double column or uh, whatever access you, you perform. I mean, you, we can always see that an extension is uh, accessing the internals. So that would be called uh, something uh, for a sort of impolite coding. And uh, well, we are not forbidding it, but it's it's possible. So in that sense, we're both we're trying to be both flexible and um, and you know um, well well structured. And I think here the language really helps us doing this. So does it, does this answer, answer your question? Yeah, it does. Uh, I was that's what I was mostly wondering about because I haven't gotten to look at um, any of these like extensions out there. I know that there's actually like a few other ones. I think they're a bit older that haven't really been used um, too much. So I wasn't too sure if you guys were using like a kind of like an extensions API or if you guys were just using the basic stuff built into Common Lisp, um, which makes more sense to use the base the stuff built into Common Lisp really. So I think that's. Good choice. Like a good choice, am I? Yeah. So maybe it's time also to talk about something else we've been working on recently. Uh, support for yeah. web extensions, and by by this I mean the standard, like mm -hmm. extensions are being used in Firefox and Chrome. Um, so maybe one of the most famous one would be uBlock Origin, uh, etc. So uh, this is currently not supported by Next, but we've been working on it uh, on the development branch. And uh, there's been good progress there in the sense that we are already able to um, to run some uh, demo uh, web extensions. And uh, well, we are uh, hoping that we someday we'll be able to to run the full blown extensions like uBlock Origin. 
So in that sense, we'll be able to support both list-based extensions and the JavaScript standard-based uh, web extensions. Um, I, I, if you don't mind, Gavin, I, I think I can rephrase your, your question a little bit because uh, I don't think it was fully covered. Uh, Pierre, I think the question was, do we have a protocol that extensions must adhere to to be an extension? Like, do we have a API that we say, okay, register extension and then the name of the extension? Or, or yeah, whatever. right, right. Uh, I missed that part of the question, sorry. So we do, I mean, uh, we, but that's that's mostly at the language level. So we're leveraging all, in common is what is called ASDF. Uh, so that's really what we're doing. So uh, there is a protocol here, uh, well-structured, well-designed protocol, and we're just leveraging this. So you would install uh, a next extension the, exactly the way you would install a, a common list library, uh, except that it would be at the spot where next uh, would know what to read it. That's about it. Yeah, other than that, there's literally uh, no restriction on what your code can do. So the API is very open. So it's like theoretically, you could do it through something like Quick Lisp, Quick Lisp or... Uh... Yeah, you, you could install extensions through Quick Lisp if you so desired, yes. Well, that's really it. okay. So there is like a, that makes sense. There is an approach to it that you have in mind, but it would be using ASDF um, as you mentioned. Now, another question I had on the topic of uh, how Atlas is ran is that I saw that obviously a lot of you guys are all remote, and I was wondering if you guys ran it, run into difficulties, um, specifically around the idea of like making decisions um, since you guys are all in different time zones and everything. Um, and I saw that in your on one of your guys' pages, you mentioned that you guys meet up like once a week to chat about things. Um, I was just wondering if that leads to a lot of uh, issues where maybe one of you is working on something and your team and you guys as a team decide, oh, maybe we should go a different direction. I was wondering how often stuff like that happens. So uh, you can imagine that in a typical organization that would happen very frequently. And a lot of companies have experienced this uh, challenge when shifting to remote uh, work. Since we were started uh, initially as a remote company, you know, myself being in Berlin and Pierre being in uh, Paris, we thought about these issues and, and structured our processes around, around them rather than trying to shoehorn our processes into a remote um, trying to shoehorn an in-person process into a, a remote uh, uh, strategy. So we have a couple of things that we do to mitigate these issues. Number one, we try to write very, very clear emails and very thorough emails. So whenever there's some decision to be made, because there could be a 24 to 48 hour lead time until you can respond, right? You don't know when the person's asleep or awake. Um, you better make sure that you've considered all counter arguments, all you know possibilities, and you've write, written something that's uh, that's a good proposal. We want to make sure that every time we talk, we say things that are uh, not going to be misconstrued and are not going to be full of holes. So that's the first strategy. Write good emails thoughtfully. And we avoid ping pong back and forth, like, oh, what did you mean? No, that never happens. I'm mean, okay, fine. It does happen, but we try to minimize it, right? The second thing is um, every week we discuss and we try to agree on uh, what are the high level objectives. If we all have the same high level objectives, then I can reasonably guess what Pierre will think about a decision. And I can think about how to justify. Uh, that decision to beer. So to make this a little less abstract, let's agree that this week we're going to build a snow fort. And the question should be, uh, should I be, um, should I be packing a swimsuit into my luggage? Obviously packing a swimsuit into my luggage doesn't aid in us producing a snow, snow fort. So I can't exactly do a good job to convince Pierre that I should be packing my swimsuit into my luggage. You know, that's more like for a trip to the Bahamas. 
I, that was kind of a strange example. Obviously, it was a pretty strange example. But does that make any sense? Yeah, no, that totally does. I think that's. Uh, I think the clear emails thing, especially, makes a lot of sense. Because um, my company, as well, is also going has gone remote, and so these were like some issues we had faced. So I was interested in what you guys did to make up for it. Because obviously, you guys have a different workflow from what the average, uh, you know, normal sort of corporate company would ch- kind of do with the stand ups every day sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I've gone through the stand ups as well in a different company, and. Uh... Personally, I didn't like it much. I think uh, I felt like uh, every day I was wasting my time. I felt a little bit like uh, a soldier being called to duty uh, of a sword. Uh, but um, but at, at the beginning at that class, also we iterated quite a lot in terms of our organizational structure. You know, like uh, uh, what do we do? Like uh, how many hours per per call? How many meetings per week, etc. So it took a little while until we find our uh, crew speed. And but I think. Now we've been doing it for maybe a year or so, and I've been very uh, all this while I've been very happy with the rhythm we found. I find it very healthy and well balanced, and and productive at the same time. It doesn't feel like I'm ever wasting my time, and uh, and, and on the other hand, it's also not like uh, we are so remote that we lose touch. So I think it's very important to find to strike the right balance here. A, a very important thing is trust. And one of the reasons I think people have these daily standups, maybe it's not a reason that they're going to say, but I think it's because they don't necessarily trust every engineer and they want to have some sort of, you know, accountability in quotes. Uh, So getting someone to say, oh, you know, yesterday I accomplished nothing (laughs) is a little bit uh, whatever. So instead uh, what we do is, I trust everyone fully on the team. I give them the agency. Well, I don't give them the agency. They have their agency and I uh, don't control them. I I believe in them uh, and we talk and we say, okay, hey guys, um, this is what we're going to do. And, and everybody is, is a, uh, an intelligent actor. At least I, you know, most of the time myself, sometimes, you know, I, I make mistakes. We all make mistakes, but we try to do what's correct and uh, let people own things, you know? So we don't need to do this daily stand-up micromanaging. I'm, I don't I don't keep track of how many tasks anybody's done or, or whatever. It's, it's really not important. So you guys leave the um, task management stuff to just the individuals, really? Yes. You guys use, like, I assume you guys don't use like a Jira or one of those Trello boards or something like that. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. The yeah. closest we've come to that is uh, when we first started, uh, we had a org document where we would tag <laughs> tag issues so that we wouldn't be stepping on each other's toes. That makes sense. Well, I mean, now we also have the GitHub, uh, GitHub issue tracker, which mm-hmm. is, well, it's not like uh, we've putting, we're putting any deadline and we're assigning tasks to people. So we, we, but we can tr- keep track on who is doing what without pressure. I think that's good to be taking advantage of. I feel like a lot of companies don't make enough use of like the issue system that they're already working with. So it makes perfect sense. Uh, And just to bring this whole thing full circle, I was interested in how you guys individually, like each of you got interested in Lisp itself. Um, Okay, I'll start with this one. So for me, it happened about, uh... 2016, I would say, or something like this. I mean, I've been using Emacs for a very long time before that, but it's only more recently that uh, I grew really fond of it. So I started writing extensions for Emacs, and I suppose that's also my, one of the main gateways to, to Lisp, because uh, Emacs being the most popular Lisp program, uh, I think, on, in use uh, on the planet, well, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but then uh, I got more curious, and I want to know more. I mean, uh, I want to grow my Lisp ecosystem, and I, very soon I would hit some uh, limits in Emacs. So I discovered, uh, well, I discovered lots of stuff on, on Reddit, and uh, the among others, uh, the Lisp operating system, oh, sorry, uh, the Geeks operating system, written in Guy Scheme. So that got me to learn Scheme, and uh, Around the same time, I also learned about the next project, which was at, at the time in, in its infancy. 
So I was very eager to to know more. I knew almost no command list at the time. So I tried to install it and uh, I struggled because at the beginning it was mostly developed on Mac and I didn't have a Mac. So I, I tried porting it and that's uh, at that period of time that I contacted John and asking him, uh, hey, uh, maybe I could be the guy uh, porting it for, for Linux. Uh, and that's basically how we I got started. So from then on, uh, I learned Common Lisp and uh, uh, I guess today this would be my favorite Lisp and uh, the one I'm most proficient with. That's really impressive. So you decided to try and port it, port Nix, uh, before you had started really got, getting to learn Common Lisp very much then? Yeah, but, you know, like, I, I could already read it because yeah. uh, it's, in terms of syntax, it's the same all over the place, right? With uh, very few exceptions. So I could read it, then uh, I just picked up Practical Common Lisp. Uh, it's a free book online. And I learned about class, which was, I think, uh, the, the, the main part of the language that uh, I knew very little about and it was uh, heavily used in Next. Um, and then, you know, I just uh, went ahead and uh, I learned little bit by little, step by step, mm -hmm. filling the holes where, wherever needed. I think the lesson here is that if you have any problems with Next, you can email Pierre to his personal email and complain to him. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, the port is perfect. I mean, see it for yourself. It's working on, on Linux and, well, <laughs> not so good on Mac anymore. Yeah. So we, we, could, we could file a complaint to John about this. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, as per myself uh, and learning Lisp, I had a, uh, a compiler's teacher. Uh, programming language compilers teacher. Uh, I don't know if I should mention his name. I, well, anyways, he was uh, he was really, really good uh, computer scientist. And he had uh, an obsession with uh, with Lisp. And yeah, he was learning closure and, and whatever. And he would show us little demos. And what really inspired me was he when I first started university, my freshman year, I took some courses with him and he was using Vim. And then by the time I took my senior year, he was using Emacs. And I was like, wow, what what happened to this guy? You know, I mean, for him to be convinced, and he was like a hardcore Vim guy. So for him to have been convinced away from that, I started to think, man, maybe there's something to this, you know, maybe there's something. And so um, I installed Emacs. Um, I got a little bit extreme. I was using just a like a, a blank TTY with no window manager and just Emacs uh, full screen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, for some time. And then and then I became more reasonable. I went back to actually using a window manager. And anyways, using Emacs for a long time, I'm like, okay, let's go to the next level and let's learn Lisp. And uh, when it came time to make the web browser I, I started by by first making a compiler for Lisp. Actually, uh, it was all written in C, and then um, and then I went to the Common Lisp IRC channel, and one of them said, "Hey, why don't you just write it in Common Lisp?" I said, oh, "Okay, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why that never occurred to me. I started writing in compilers, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> there you go." That's your answer. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty. So you thought you so you intended to make a uh, compiler for a Lisp to write the browser in? Is that that's cor that that's correct, and that's what I had done. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty funny. That's kind of like how I guess a lot of people say like it's. Uh, I think it used to be. I'm, I haven't experienced this, but it used to be a common thing for in compiler classes to write a Lisp interpreter. Because um, in theory, it would be very straightforward. So I guess if you're going to write your own Lisp to write a browser, and I guess it's not that, well, it sounds pretty insane to begin with either way. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't really a good idea, um, <laughs> right? I, I would have been resolving all of the same performance issues that the people have already dealt with in, in all the various implementations. So Yeah, it makes perfect sense to go with one that is tried and true and tested for decades at this point. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the biggest mistakes, um, well, 
not the biggest mistake. So one thing I want to emphasize is that in Next, we will rewrite something as many times as it takes to get it right. So one of the first things that we did, uh, well, the, the first thing, right? I scrapped this compiler. We're done with this. We have to rewrite it. And so I rewrote it in ECL. Uh, that's uh, oh, wow. embedded, embeddable common list, right? Yeah. And then again, uh, after we experience some problems with uh, performance, scrap it again, start over, you know, uh, you get some uh, advice on the list panel and you go down a route and then you realize, okay, that wasn't so good. And you can keep patching till oblivion and doing these incremental changes, but ultimately the only way is to rewrite uh, I believe to make a good product. So, on the uh, on the topic of hitting roadblocks and rewriting and stuff, I was wondering if there's any. That's why I'd like to make the whole uh, interview about the great things about Lisp. I feel like there are some things that I feel like are uh, maybe not like an issue with Lisp, but are roadblocks that you run into. Like for example, um, like readability isn't a thing on a certain level, but on a certain point, it's nice to just be able to see simple syntax points uh, in certain situations. For example, when you just see a wall of parentheses, it's readable in the fact that you can look at it and understand it. But I find like something like a, a simple if statement in something like C versus an if statement in uh, Lisp obviously takes a bit more focus to see like, okay, here's what's going on. I don't know if you guys ever feel that way, but I was wondering if you guys have ever hit any points, any pain points where you kind of feel like, oh, this is one of the things that I feel is a bit weaker in Lisp, even though obviously there's so many good things that it's hard for that really one minor issue to be a, uh, a roadblock. Um, honestly, uh, I think I understand the, the feeling you're describing because uh, I believe I had it, I've had it um, a couple of years ago because I, I don't come from a Lisp background. Where I've, like most of us have learned, uh, First, I go start study, uh, studying C and then uh, other languages from the family. So at first, I found that Emacs Lisp was weird. Uh, I was very confused. Like, how do you write a for loop, for instance? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it seemed uh, needlessly complicated to my mind or to my eyes, at least. But then, uh, when I got like when I got accustomed to ling language and it really uh, simmered down my mind, then uh, uh, it became natural and to the point that uh, it didn't make any difference. So I think it's really just a matter of, uh, you know, well, whether you choose to, the syntax should go from left to right or right to left, you know, it's just a matter of uh, convention. And uh, once you're satisfied with it, then the list syntax in my experience is vastly superior to that of practically any language because it's uh, both extremely simple uh, minimal and uh, as powerful as it gets. It's um, it's homo iconic, so it's a language that can write itself, and it doesn't have any uh, syntactical limitations, which uh, in that sense, and no languages from the C family or anything similar to Python would have. I mean, all these languages at some point would hit a syntactic uh, limitation. So. Mm -hmm. I think really here the bottom line of this uh, of my answer here is uh, it's just a matter of habit, and once you you get used to it, well, you can enjoy the syntactic power. I think the question is actually more abstract. This is your opportunity to complain about the limitations of Lisp, not necessarily to address the question about syntax that Gavin proposed. At least that's oh, okay. my that's my understanding. Yeah. Honestly, well, I, think the, I think syntax was just an example that I figured it was something oh, that okay, okay. rather than because uh, I figure I figure most of the viewers haven't used uh, Lisp very much, so I figured they probably syntax is something they've probably at least seen. But yeah, I think the, more on a broader co concept for like example, like I haven't worked with like how hash maps work in Lisp, but I've heard of like performance implications from it. I was interested in that sort of concept of like what are some things that are an issue with Lisp that you've had to like work around, giving you an opportunity, yeah, like John said, to say like the limitations or issues that you've run into Lisp, with Lisp. Well, I, as far as I know, I mean, uh, so I, I can only compare Lisp to the uh, common Lisp, the other languages that I know, and <laughs> they're mostly from the Lisp family. So if I want to compare it with uh, Scheme, for instance, um, 
scheme has uh, a few concepts, powerful concepts that commonly doesn't have, like uh, continuation, uh, first class continuations, and uh, environment, first first class environments. So, to you cannot really have them in common list without a dramatical uh, change to the language. And uh, yes, they could be limiting, but well, uh, touch wood. I mean, it hasn't hit us so far. Next, so in that sense, uh, I suppose that it's uh, rare enough that uh, we, you would see such uh, a limitation in common list. Now, compared to other languages, so uh, you mentioned hash uh, hash table performance and so on. I think in terms of performance, it really depends on your compiler. It's not really the language, I would say. Maybe I'm wrong here. Well, maybe it's a complex issue. But compilers, so the one that we use is called SBCL, and it's a very it's very performant. We, we can also use other compilers like CCL, which is also a very performant one. So performance is really not an issue, uh, in my experience in Common Lisp. It's, uh, it plays in the same ballpark as languages like uh, Go or Java, etc., And uh, probably far faster than uh, Python and, and Ruby. So yeah, that's also not really a big deal in my experience. And the, the very performance hungry part of the browser is anyways the web renderer, which is not in common list, at least not today. We are deferring to uh, C library here. So here the, the question is completely different. Um, and beside all this, uh, well, in my experience, I haven't seen much. I know that languages like Haskell have uh, much more to offer in terms of functional programming, uh, which you can still do in, in, in common list in, in terms of style but it's not enforced. So Haskell is much more pure in that sense, um, and common Lisp is not. So there would be some uh, less guarantees there. That's true. So it's, it's harder to see if, if things are mutating or not. So I would say that would be one of the biggest limitations that I've witnessed. Um, but it's fine. I mean, in practice, if you've, if you've got a good style, a good test suite, et cetera, et cetera uh, I would say that you can uh, you can keep up with it. Yeah. Uh, I I would like to add something that I hear a lot, which is the absence of libraries or documentation for those libraries. This often comes up um, because the common list community is smaller. There's not necessarily going to always be a library for literally everything that you want. In JavaScript, there will be. Now, the flip side of this is that we don't have issues like the left pad plus plus fiasco. Um, we don't find ourselves um, with people injecting, you know, vulnerabilities or crypto miners into uh, the Lisp uh, package packages, you know, again, because it's a smaller community. Uh, additionally, another thing that beginners will often cite is oh, this library hasn't been updated in 10 years. But what they don't necessarily feel or understand uh, in it, I think it's called tacit, in a tacit sense yet, is that Lisp code written 10 years ago can be done. It can still run on a modern day compiler. We don't have the sand shifting out from underneath our feet. So um, the, the common problem is, for beginners is libraries and documentation of said libraries. But I'm, I'm trying to let beginners know that these problems aren't actually that bad. There are actually a ton of libraries because there's you know 40 years of Lisp heritage uh, writing quality things. Yeah, and if, I do know that there are like some tools to generate C bindings for different libraries too, which I feel like opens up the opportunity to pretty much anything at that point, because pretty much every language that has a lot of libraries for their very specific use cases are usually just C bindings in the end, so. 100%, yeah. There's something called Grovel, and Grovel, part. I believe this is how it works. I believe it parses H files, and it will uh, automatically generate stubs for CFFI. And actually, CFFI in Lisp is especially cool because you can, have a, a running image, you can make a binding, like while your Lisp is running, and then invoke that C function from that shared library uh, without, you know, restarting your program or anything like that. 
Yeah, I've seen some people do that with like o- OpenGL and stuff like that, which just blows my mind to imagine. Like I, I can't imagine how uh, much that would change like the workflow for people that like create video games or create uh, 3D like uh, procedurally generated 3D models. I think there's a lot of potential there, like you were saying before, like being able to just modify basically a C program, like a program that would be accessing C, C code at runtime. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, and uh, one other question that I was wondering about was whether uh, in the long term, so I know that you guys said that you guys use uh, SBCL. And so I was interested in um, your guys' view on whether, like I assume that this is like way too much of a time commitment, but I know like the Lisp, like the larger Lisp community often seems to prioritize trying to be uh, implementation agnostic. Do you guys try to do that when you can, or just kind of like accept that that's not very possible to do in this case? Yeah, we are. Uh, so we are, Nix tries to be a, uh, implementation agnostic. So there is nothing specific to SBCL in our code. And when it is, then uh, there is, uh, so common list has the equivalent of the if def in C. So you can write uh, compiler specific code uh, that won't bother uh, any other compiler. So, uh, and uh, this is still written list, by the way, it's not a different micro language, so it's really cool. Uh, so yeah, bottom line, uh, it is portable and technically it works on CCL, although there is a uh, minor issues, but uh, it does work for it as well. And it might work even in other compilers, although they are not really tested for performance reasons. All right, that's good to hear. That's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, because the only reason I was interested was because of I had seen like some uh, some of the type declarations that you do in SBCL have like type checking, uh, compile time type checking. So I wasn't too sure if that was something that Nix was going to be relying on or not. Um, but yeah, that's great to hear. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for questions. Is there anything you guys wanted to bring up during the interview as well? Uh, I'm, give me a second to think. <laughs> All good. Well, in the meantime, uh, Gavin, I would like to thank you for the video that you published about Next. Uh, I watched it with uh, great interest. That was uh, exciting, uh, interesting, and uh, well, lots of fun to watch. Great video, man. Thanks. <laughs> I'm happy to have made it. I was, I've been very interested in the project for like a long time, well before I started actually even using Emacs or knowing too much about Lisp. I like went through a a scheme phase. <laughs> uh -huh. I also like how uh, genuinely honest you were and addressing some of the uh, common critiques in Next. So yep, that's also completely fair. I also I also realized that after the video that there were some of the issues that I faced were actually there were addressed already. So that was good to see. Um, yeah, exactly. A, a video following up later on, maybe in a future release, hopefully informing nice. people about those uh those fixes yep thanks so yeah to 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 uh copy what pierre said uh, <laughs> I, re I i really enjoyed the video myself and your critiques were indeed fair and i appreciate the critiques as any opportunity to actually make nix better um you know we see what's wrong and that that's the the valuable feedback that we need. You know, we're so much in our little bubble that I don't have I don't have a clue what's what's bad, what's good, what's hard. You know, um, mm -hmm. so that feedback is invaluable. Yeah, uh, it's good to it's good to listen to that sort of stuff because some things like when you were talking about the people say that there's not enough documentation for Lisp stuff. A lot of times they just don't realize that sometimes the documentation is just like in the REPL if you access it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or or the doc strings. They don't mm -hmm. think to like actually just look at the the or the package definitions. Like yeah. there's pretty standard ways of, of exposing functions in the library. Just because it's not pushed out into a readme doesn't mean it's not documented. But anyways. Um yeah, I you know, I guess that's in contrast to Algol like languages where it they don't really they really expect the whole API to be laid out because it's not explorable, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, the, the last thing I wanted to say was um, I, I hope that we can make uh, a browser that 
that really helps people and really actually does make them, you know, more productive and uh, it's fun to use and it's stable and it can help spread the, the word of, I feel like a missionary. I can sp spread the word of Lisp, you know, and um, we can take some of these really interesting concepts and democratize their access. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun thing, you know. Um, I can imagine that the stage of computing we're in right now is still so much in its infancy. People think that just because we're not running Windows 95, we're running advanced systems. But the UI paradigms between now and Windows 95 uh, are basically the same. What are the differences? Now you can snap Windows. Um, I, I don't know. I can't really think of any other things. <laughs> so I, I think that experts deserve expert tools. And um, we should empower people to actually utilize the great resource that is the internet. And that's what I hope to do. Nice. I think you guys are doing a great job at that. I'm excited to see what people in the comments say about this video. Hopefully uh, it increases the interaction with your guys' community. It's been really great having you guys on. If there's anything you guys want to plug, um, anything that you guys have been working on inside of this that you haven't got a chance to plug, now's a good chance. Yeah. Make sure to hit the subscribe button for Gavin uh, <laughs> and um, Patreon as well, of course. That's it. <laughs> Do you already have anything to add? Uh, the same. Well, uh, don't forget the subscribe button for us. We don't have one, but uh, you can go on a Patreon too. <laughs> all right. Well, if that's all, then I'll go ahead and end the recording. Thanks a bunch for joining us, you guys. Mm -hmm.